I'm investigative reporter Chris Halsney, and this is Interview with Evil, Ted Bundy's FBI Confessions. This episode digs into a series of murders the famed serial killer says he did not commit, yet ones that seasoned detectives still to this day say he did. For the past several months, we've been going through rare audio files of Ted Bundy on the cusp of his execution, confessing to all sorts of awful things. What I want to do with you is something we haven't done before, and which is talk about something very specific. This is something I've held, uh, God forbid, but I've held for all these many years, 15 years or so. I think I'm glad we started with that particular individual uh, victim case because it was one of the unidentified ones, more or less. You went on, you know, in, in some. Uh, I think you had your suspicions, obvious and very strong uh, suspicions. But so we we start with case which I think kind of demonstrates or, or exemplifies what we're trying to do, what, what kind of information I have. I have more, I intend to talk to Colorado authorities about one of the, their cases uh, that were remains, have, have, where they found nothing, mm-hmm. absolutely nothing, and where they, they can. Inside the prison room, conducting the majority of the interview, is Bob Keppel, a special investigator for the Washington Attorney General. On first appearance, you might think Keppel is simply shooting in the dark by asking Bundy about certain unsolved crimes. Maybe he'll admit to them. Who knows? Might as well ask. No, Keppel is asking because detectives believe Bundy has knowledge of the crimes. Uh, I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, so I agree with that date. August of '74. Well, first of all, well, I, I'll, I'm, you're getting a little bit ahead of me here, but I don't mind because I don't, I don't want to get picky with you about this. Oh, there's a lot of other stuff that I need to let you and Bill know about that's going on. But let's just deal with that one, for example. I mean, so I was talking to one of my advisors not long ago, and they were saying the information you can give that will exclude you is sometimes maybe just as much important as because you know I'm linked with stuff that that's not real. And if I'm mistake, not mistaken that August 74 date refers to a young woman out of uh, the southwestern part of the state who, was, who disappeared and was found in the past somewhere, or it remains. I may be completely wrong in this. What are you talking about? Both, there are two skeletons found together in Clark County. August 2nd was the date that one of the girls was last. Right. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm familiar with it. I mean, I've heard of it. I, that's nothing to do with me. To clarify, Detective Keppel asked Bundy about a pair of skeletons found outside Vancouver, Washington, near the Oregon border. One set of remains belonged to 20-year-old Carol Valenzuela, the other to Martha Morrison. Although detectives did not know Morrison's name at that point, we will fully analyze those cases in a few moments. When I was in new agents training which would have been 1981 to get a better understanding of bundy's believability i called dr mary ellen o'toole she spent her career as a top-notch criminal profiler in the fbi's highly touted behavioral analysis unit or bau you go into these interviews knowing that if these offenders like ted bundy like gary ridgeway are psychopathic individuals which is the modern term, the old term was sociopath. If they, in fact, have psychopathic traits, one of them is that they're profound liars, pathological liars. And pathological means they'll lie about everything. I know that that was the case about Gary Ridgway. So we had to be very careful about just accepting what he told us in terms of his behavior. All of his admissions had to be corroborated by some kind of physical evidence. Because what's amazing is that when you're speaking particularly about serial killers, and I know this to be true about Gary, is that they will brag about murders they didn't commit so that they can get the credit for them. Um, Gary was competitive with other serial killers and referred to himself as the best of the best. 
So you have to be knowledgeable about the personality that you're talking to. But once you do that, and you can sit down and listen to these people um, talk about what they've done, talk about their victim selection process, what they did to the victim, talk about, again, how they grew up. Again, you have to take that carefully, but talk about themselves. It is amazing what you walk away with, and not just in terms of content, but also in terms of style, in terms of how they present, in terms of when you were able to get them to divulge more than you typically could. You learn, again, not just the content, but how to approach these people and what causes them to talk and what makes them want to continue to talk. And when you have to get them back on track, what strategies worked and which ones didn't work. O'Toole is an expert at interviewing sexual psychopathic serial killers and has noticed something that does not add up in the Bundy victim timeline. Bundy never admitted to harming anyone before 1974-ish. He was 27 years old at that point. O'Toole says it's highly unlikely a serial killer all of a sudden starts mutilating women so late in life. We know that when somebody becomes a serial killer, that means that they're on their game. That means that they fit the definition. They've developed the how they're going to do it, when they're going to do it, who the victim is going to be. So what precedes that, therefore, has to be practice murders. You don't wake up one morning and are a Ted Bundy or are a Gary Ridgway. You have got to practice that you know you want to use a gun, a knife, ligatures. You know you want to select a certain victim who um, looks a particular way or you know that you're going to you know, use a vehicle, you're going to use a ruse or a con to approach your victim. All of that requires practice. Practice victims are the first victims in a serial killer's um, life where they've, they've learned to do it in a way that they can get away with and in a way that they like, in a way that gives them the pleasure that they're going after. So it's the practice murders that are sloppy. It's the practice murders that um, show a lot of trial and error. It's the practice murders that put them pretty close to their neighborhood or to a family member, and they're not on their game. It's when they become a serial killer officially that they're really good at what they do. And they, they can brag about that, but the first, the first murders that they do are murders that um, were not, in their eyes, efficient and well done, well thought out, because they were just practicing and so they don't admit to them. They just they just let those go unsolved, even if they admit to twelve others. They, but they can admit to them. I mean, it's not a rule, hard fast rule. They can admit to them, but as an as a investigator, knowing that ahead of time when you go in, that they may not be inclined to want to talk about the little boy down the street that that they assaulted. Because Gary told me about the little boy that he stabbed, and the little boy got away and. Um, fortunately, the little boy lived, and later on when the little boy is an adult male, they were able to contact him and confirm that's, in fact, what happened. It took a lot to get R- Gary Ridgway to admit that, and then he unadmitted it, and then he admitted it. And so the question is, why did he do that? Well, it, he went after a little boy, and the, the little boy didn't do anything to him, and so he didn't want to admit that, and, and he failed at it. The, boy, the little boy lived. It was, it was, um, you know, it, he was out of his, at that point, it was still trial and error. He had used a knife. Going forward, he did not. So it was not one that, I hate to use this, use it this way. It didn't, Gary took a lot of um, pride in being a, a lean, mean killing machine. And, and that was not that. So I think, I don't want to say it's embarrassment, but, those murders have a lot of errors in them. They have a lot of mistakes in them. They have victims that are um, not consistent with the victims that they that they go after when they're serial murderers. So they don't want to be attached to them. They don't feel bad. So don't mistake that for having empathy for the first practice murders. So as an investigator, you go back and when you identify a serial killer. You go back to the time they were in their late teens or their early 20s. 
and you look for people that died around them, maybe died an uh, older lady that died down the street or somebody in their family that mysteriously died. So it's up to the investigator to usually go back and confirm um, where do those practice murders take place? Because we know that they did. You cannot wake up one morning and become a professional at what you do. Using Bundy's own words, I say, let's just start with one, Anne Marie Burr. She was eight years old when she disappeared in the middle of the night from her bedroom in Tacoma, Washington, August 31, 1961. A teenage Bundy lived with his mom in Tacoma at that same time. Let's first listen to the unredacted section of Bundy's denial and reasons he gave to Keppel as to why he is not the one who killed the little girl. And then I'll tell you more about the case and why Keppel thinks he did. Now, a thousand people asked me to ask you this. Ask for About Anne Marie Burr. Oh, great. That's one of the No, absolutely not. Definitely not. Oh, I promise you. Yeah. I, I told you, I, I wish that people would believe. They believe everything else except my answer is no. Right. Uh-huh. On that one. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and that's it's very sad. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's also so ludicrous because, I mean, I don't know if you ever looked at it in the course of your studies. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's all the way across town. Really, from where I was a kid, I went out and, and had my paper route. And the influence was from instance that I, my paper route that came close to or included the bird at home. Well, my understanding is it's, you know, for a kid, where the birds is, as it relates to where I lived, it was in a different part of the world. We were, that was a pretty long ways away. Different schools, different high schools. Uh, never went to that area. Never had any occasion to go there. It was just district. It was part of the forest. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, that was only like 13, 14 years old, mm-hmm. or less. No, absolutely not. And I wish there was some way to. But I wrote to Mrs. Burr's psychiatrist one time to ask her to. Conte? Conte. And then he in turn wrote her and written her several letters because, you know, it's my hometown, first of all. Not that it should make any difference, but um, um, there are some allegations that he's not feeling the need to answer or felt the need to answer back then. And I was just as, as emphatic as I could be. Where did you were when you first met? Just be one more question. Bundy is so incredibly snarky, right to his last breath. Keppel asks a great question. When and where was your first murder? Now here are the facts about the Anne Marie Burr case. The little eight-year-old girl went to sleep in her upstairs bedroom with her three-year-old sister. It was a warm August night, and the next morning, the parents found her missing, the door ajar, and the living room window open. There was a huge manhunt the next day looking for her. Soldiers from a nearby army base spread out all over town, as did neighbors and family. Ted Bundy at that time was 14 years old. His newspaper route didn't include the Burr home, but it wasn't that far off, and Bundy's favorite uncle lived nearby. Police never suspected an adult conducted the kidnapping of Anne Marie Burr. A size six shoe imprint was found outside the house. In 2011, when I was working at the local CVS in Seattle, cold case detectives did two things. First, they asked Florida prison officials to upload Bundy's DNA into a national database. I was surprised that had never been done before, but there was a legal reason. The Florida legislature needed to update a statute which prevented DNA from being used in certain profiles. 
Once that law was enacted, Tacoma police sent a few old remnants of DNA evidence from the Burr case to the Washington State Crime Lab for testing. They hoped advances in microDNA analysis could help them match samples to Bundy. However, there was not enough material to draw any conclusions. Beverly, Anne Marie's mom, told Cairo 7, we'll just have to keep going on and pray and hope somehow we'll someday know. Both she and Anne Marie's dad died without ever knowing who kidnapped their little girl. Dr. O'Toole is currently the director of the Forensic Science Program at George Mason University and author of a really cool book titled Dangerous Instincts, How Gut Feelings Betray Us. She hasn't listened to the Bundy confessional recordings for years and didn't get a chance to personally interview him. But she did interview Seattle's Green River killer, Gary Ridgway, and she sees a lot of similarities. Well, some of these serial killers, impression management is very important to them, meaning they want to manage your impression of them. And so there are some behaviors and, and some things, and they'll test you in an interview, that they know they can tell you that, are, that they feel are so heinous that it could change your opinion of them. And so I've had serial killers absolutely jump up and down and say, I've never killed a child, I only kill women. Like that's a laudable distinction without a difference. Um, but they make that because they don't want to be seen as a child killer or child molester, only to find out that that, in fact, was not true and they crossed over the line. And so as an interviewer, you have to go in and try to communicate to them that you're very open to all the violence and the deviancy and the, um, um, you know, the behave all the criminal behavior that you know that they've been involved in, and you sit there and you really need to listen and not do a lot of talking. And so, because we know that psychopathic serial sexual killers are very grandiose, you want to play to that ego. And the more you can sit there and listen and communicate somehow to them that you're basically learning from the master. And the more they tell you, the more impressive that it gets. And the more they tell you, the more they kind of rank up there on um, the most um, prolific or the most difficult to catch serial murder. It's in their interest to do that. So you have to play to their personality. You can't go in there and throw down the gauntlet and say, let me tell you who I am. Let me tell you how many interviews I've done. Let me tell you what I expect from you. That will never work because they're going to control the interview. They're going to control what they tell you. And you have to get over that and try to move around that to let them know that you are sitting there listening to the master talk. Doesn't that just make you sick to your stomach, though? I mean, how do you personally feel letting someone be the master of something so horrible? No, it doesn't make me sick to my stomach at all. I that's the one thing I think for those of us that have done these interviews and really, I hate to use the word enjoy them, but really find them absolutely fascinating, necessary, intriguing, beneficial, educational. Sitting down and listening to someone tell you their story, as deviant and criminal as it may be, you walk away with a lot of information. And you raise a good point because one of the things I found over my 35-year career in law enforcement was that the worst interviewers were people who couldn't listen. They just wouldn't listen. And they found that they needed to control the interview, turn it around, interrupt, hijack the interview. You cannot do that in these kinds of cases. You have to have a genuine, deep-seated interest in hearing this person's story, no matter if it's Gary Ridgway, if it's if it's Ted Bundy, um, or if it's somebody else who's not criminal in any way, you have to you have to ask yourself, do, am I that person who has a genuine interest in listening to this person's story? Because it's, if it's your story, you're the master. And, and I don't mean master in that sexual concept, but master in terms of it's your story. You tell it, and I'm going to listen. And I've always found that fascinating. A lot of people don't want to do it that way. To help me better understand some other unsolved murders Bob Keppel asked Bundy about during his confessional recordings, 
I reached out to Tiffany Jean. She runs a blog called Hi, I'm Ted. I'll tell you something. I have not found a more comprehensive data collection of Ted Bundy's crimes and victim profiles anywhere. And Jean just keeps gathering the most amazing things, undiscovered or previously redacted police files, notes, pictures, and recordings. And I didn't really know that much about him beforehand, but I thought the story was just so bizarre. It was the strangest story I'd ever heard. And I realized I knew the name. It was kind of a household name, but I didn't really know anything about the case. And the more I started researching it, just the stranger it got. There's just so many moving parts and layers to it. And uh, it just seems to keep going. I keep finding more stuff and I keep learning about the case. And it's, it's such a strange, it's such a strange story and such a sad story. And um, so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to kind of bring some of these documents to light. I don't do as much of the audio. I do more of the case files is what I'm mostly interested in and learning more about the victims too. I recently found a um, document from uh, Washington State where there was a, a nonprofit that was set up in 1980 just to send him money to support him while he was in prison from his friends back in Washington who still believed that he was innocent. Um, even though he had, at this point, he'd been convicted of uh, Kim Leach murder and the Kai Omega murders, and he was on death row. And several people in Washington were still contributing money to help him. So it just shows you, like, how how much people believed in, in, in his innocence and believed that he was a good guy who could never do these things. Once again, Keppel's questions are hard to hear, and I will recap them in a moment. But listen to him asking Bundy about a string of unsolved murders. By the way, FBI profiler Bill Hegmeyer is listening in on this conversation, but he rarely speaks. In this section, I find it interesting Bundy knew exactly who the detective was talking about, although Keppel never used any of the victims' names. I mean, I've got girls like in 1971 at WSU. Been murdered, but I'm curious about. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, two stewardesses. Yeah, I can tell you. I can tell you. Um, yeah, we can do it that way if you'd like uh, too. Uh, and I, it's that's maybe in some ways that's easier. I can tell you what uh, that's. You know that what I'm not involved in. Uh, you know if you have if you have a list of that type in your head. Uh, there's Gallup and Bellingham River strangled in 1970. No. There's Gallup in 1971, Thurston County. No. Not that far back. Nothing that far back. Yeah, I think you once showed me that. No. 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 Which one? No, absolutely not. And I, one thing I'd like to do on some of these, I mean, on all of this, if it's possible, and I think it's important. It's important for me. It's important for credibility because there's so much question about my credibility. You know, I would like, I would like to be a polygraph, uh, have a polygraph examination if that can be done on these kinds of things. Do something to enhance the the credibility of not just, you know, specifics. I mean, of the specifics, of course, but uh, of uh, my overall account of these things. Okay, let's first dig into those two dead stewardesses with Jean's help. And so what happened was um, in June of 1966, there were two um, stewardesses, as they were known back then, flight attendants for United Airlines. And they were both very young. I think they were maybe 19, 20 years old. And um, their names were Lisa Wick and Lonnie Trumbull. They were living in Queen Anne, which is a district in Seattle. And um, the third roommate, Joyce, came home around 9 a.m. the next morning 
and found both Lisa and Lonnie still in their beds in their pajamas, but they had been severely beaten and um, mostly around the head and uh, like unconscious, but still fully clothed. And Lisa was still alive. Um, they think that the reason she was still alive is because she wore curlers to bed and the curlers kind of cushioned her head against whatever that, uh, I think they ended up finding a piece of lumber and the attacker had used a piece of lumber to hit them over the head and beat them. And sadly, Lonnie died. They did get fingerprints. They got a partial palm print and fingerprints. Um, but the thing about that time, the crime scene, they allowed news reporters into the crime scene to take photos and they weren't careful about letting them leave their fingerprints around. And those fingerprints have never been matched to anyone. Um, they did try to match them. They checked them against Bundy's in 77 after he was arrested and they didn't match. But they may have belonged to someone who was never in the system who could have been one of the news reporters. Why do you think Bundy because was associated with that one? So, Probably because of Chi Omega, which, you know, obviously happened more than a decade later. Um, but the MO is kind of similar. Um, a, a piece of wood, in that case, that Chi Omega was a piece of firewood. And in this case, it was a piece of lumber. Um, and a man who entered through a door, an unlocked door, and just attacked two women in their bed. And, and, you know, he was from Seattle. Um, he had dropped out of the University of Puget Sound the year before, and he had a job at Tacoma City Light over the summer. So even though there's no indication he was in Queen Anne at that time, he was in the general area. But for Jean, all of that is a little too convenient for police. She says a heavily redacted police file on the Trumbull case indicated later that police had another suspect in mind, a security guard at SeaTac Airport, who better fit the description of the killer as described by the survivor, Lisa Wick. That case remains open and unsolved. Another reason I think it may not have been funny is the fact that the women were not sexually assaulted or molested. And that was pretty much a, a main motivation for Bundy's crimes was the sexual element. Another interesting case on Jean's Hi, I'm Ted blog, under the section of unconfirmed cases, is that of dead Washington State student, Joyce Margaret LePage. Is a pretty girl, long brown hair, kind of fit the general victim profile. She was taller, I think she was around 5'8 or 5'9. Um, she was adventurous. She had our pilot's license and she was scheduled to do a parachute jump uh, the day after she disappeared, she wanted to become a certified um, jumper. LePage went missing from Washington State University the evening of July 22, 1971. According to the Lewiston Tribune, her body was found months later wrapped in a carpet and dumped in a ravine south of Pullman. A student hunting for garnet gems found her body. The carpet came from WSU's Stevens Hall dormitory. The next day, police found the carpet missing. The FBI was called in. Bone markings indicated she had been killed with a knife. If the only reason Bundy is really tied to that case is because she fits the general profile of being an attractive college-aged girl. She disappeared from the college campus, uh, which he was known to, to have stalk around. Um, and it was in Washington. That's it. They really don't have any other ties to Bundy. So he would have had to have been scoping around a place that he was very unfamiliar with to find that. Um, and also the fact that she was stabbed is unlike Bundy. What Bundy preferred to do was, um, bludgeon girls with a crowbar famously and then strangle them. 
Um, he liked to strangle them, as he told Hagmeier, because it gave him this feeling of control, that he was God, and he could watch their last breath, leaving their, leaving their eyes, the light of life leaving their eyes. And finally, I promised I'd get back to those two girls' skeletal remains that were found north of the state park in 1973. Their names were Carol Valenzuela and Martha Morrison. Valenzuela was ID'd right away, but it took police nearly 40 years to put a name to the bones linked to Morrison. By then, another Pacific Northwest serial killer named Warren Forrest was already in prison. Blood on a gun that was linked with Forrest carried Morrison's DNA. Because the bodies were dumped in the same location, detectives later informally believed Forrest had also killed Valenzuela, although her case officially remains unsolved. This next piece of rare audio is courtesy Tiffany Jean. It is historic on so many levels. It was recorded by Florida State Prison Warden Thomas Barton at 6.15 a.m. Tuesday, January 24, 1989, only 45 minutes before Bundy was executed. Bundy admits to two additional murders and denies a series of others in rapid fashion. Just listen as he calmly details where they can find the body of 15-year-old high schooler Susan Curtis. Hmm? Do me a favor. You see that? Uh, see that almanac there? Uh, open it up to, uh, so I guess I can see a page in it. Well, to do a, a map of Utah. I think there's something that looks like a map of Utah in there. I just want something to refer to. That speak up probably for that little mic to pick up. All right, is it, is it running? Yeah, is that light on? Yeah. All right, today's January 24th, 1989. It's going to be hard between Price and Green River, about 10 miles south of Price, on a road going south, uh, going south on the road out of Price, maybe five miles, 10 miles. There's a side road to the left going toward the mountain, going east. A quarter mile in, there's a dirt road to the left. About uh, 200 yards in on the, uh, 100 to 200 yards in on the dirt road. Stop into the left of the dirt road, maybe 50 yards in. There's the remains of uh, a young woman who disappeared from Brigham Young University in June of 1975. That's as close as I can get it with the map. I mean, with what we have here. Do you know her name? No. Five foot seven, brown hair parted down the middle, Sue Curtis fit Bundy's victim profile to a T. Curtis disappeared from a youth conference in Provo, Utah, held on the BYU campus. She wore braces, and detectives had hoped they could find her remains with a metal detector, but still to this day, she has not been found. Is that it? No, there's a, to the, uh, to Mike Fisher in the, the Colorado. Bundy also admitted in this final hour to killing 24-year-old Denise Oliverson on a trip through Grand Junction, Colorado. I believe that the day would have been April 1975. Uh, the young woman's body would have been placed in the Colorado River about five miles west of Grand Junction. It was not buried. Warden Barton does his best to discover the rest of Bundy's darkest secrets in one final push for information, but he comes up short. That's all the, uh, the ones that I can help you with. That's all the ones that I know about. That, okay. uh, there are no missing ones outstanding that we haven't talked about. Okay, that's, that's all of them, Ted? 
Mm -hmm. Well, it's taking care of it for just a second. Oh, gotta get, get a smoke off somebody. Somebody have a cigarette? Ted, I had some inquiries from Illinois and, and uh, New Jersey. Okay, well, let's just deal with whatever is outstanding like that. Uh, I can say uh, without any question that there is no, uh, nothing, for instance, that, that I was involved in in Illinois or New Jersey. Okay. How about uh, Burlington, Vermont? Vermont? No. Nothing there? No. Texas? No. Miami? No. no. Okay. That's, that's all you've got. Okay, Ted. Thank you. You're welcome. Bundy's last words, courteous, gentle, and controlling his image until his very last breath. You know, like, I like your Scheherazade comparison, the Arabian Nights, where maybe he thought, I'll just give them another nugget, and then they'll give me another year, and I'll give them another nugget. And he could have bought himself years because he had so many murders. He gave like maybe one good nugget a year, or one one burial location a year, and he could have bought himself a lot of time. But I think people were just fed up, and they were just tired of of him lying and manipulating them. They just wanted it over. If he had actually come clean earlier, I don't know. Maybe it would have worked in his favor. It's hard to say. I'm investigative reporter Chris Halsney, and this is Interview with Evil, Ted Bundy's FBI Confessions. If you have enjoyed this series, found it enlightening within all the clutter of Ted Bundy materials that have come out over the years, please tell your friends, rate the show, and download the episodes from iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or any other format you desire. Please visit our Patreon page as well and support our ongoing efforts to pry public records from the hands of hesitant government officials. And finally, if you want to check out the Bundy Confessions profiled inside this podcast, download an app called Crime Door. Augmented reality creators are making a visual portal into the George Ann Hawkins kidnapping scene, enhanced by Bundy's voice and admissions. It's an experience you just have to try out. Download Crime Door today. Thanks for tuning in to Interview with Evil.